It's astonishing. All this is only 20 or 30 minutes from the heart of San Francisco. Not a human habitation in sight anywhere. I've been living out here for some months to write and to absorb an atmosphere that is different from the city, to try and find out what is the essential difference between the world of nature and the world of man. Because there's an obvious difference like the difference of artistic styles between the things that human beings do and the things that nature does, even though human beings are themselves part of nature. On the one hand, nature is wiggly. Everything wiggles. The outlines of the hills, the shapes of the trees, the way the wind brushes the grass, the clouds, the tracks of streams, it all wiggles. And for some reason or other, we find wiggly things very difficult to keep track of. Human beings are just as wiggly as nature, and our brains are an incredible mess of wiggles. And that's the part of ourselves that we understand least of all. Each one of us not only human beings, but every leaf, every weed, it exists in the way it does only because everything else around it does. In other words, there's a relationship between the center and the circumference, which is rather like the relationship between the poles of a magnet. Without the center, no circumference. Without the circumference, no center. And although we say of poles, uh, that they're the poles apart, that is to say, extremely different. There's something between them, just as the north and south poles of a magnet are united by the magnet. So the individual and the universe are inseparable. But the curious thing is, that while that's rather easy to see in theory, very few people are aware of it uh, in, a, in an important, strong way, like one is aware of blue in blue sky or of the heat in fire. It's more of an idea than it is of a realization. I suppose most of you have heard of Zen. But before going on to explain any details about it, I want to make one thing absolutely clear. I am not a Zen Buddhist. I am not advocating Zen Buddhism. I'm not trying to convert anyone to it. I have nothing to sell. I'm an entertainer. That is to say, in the same sense, that when you go to a concert and you listen to someone play Mozart, he has nothing to sell except the sound of the music. He doesn't want to convert you to anything. He doesn't want you to join an organization in favor of Mozart's music as opposed to, say, Beethoven's. And I approach you in the same spirit as a musician with his piano or a violinist with his violin. I just want you to enjoy a point of view which I enjoy.
appelé Vallero. Une rencontre, le philosophe Alan Watts. Alan Watts, comment peut-on vous définir Je ne sais vraiment pas qui je suis. Je pense que chacun d'entre nous représente fondamentalement l'énergie de tout l'univers. My mother had a big collection of Chinese art. This room is surrounded with parts of her collection of Chinese embroidery. And so as a child, I was fascinated with this art which was different from our art. It had a different view of nature, different way of looking at flowers and trees and water and birds and butterflies and people. So as a child, I was fascinated. Now, it so came about that when I was about 10 to 11 years old, I began to read thriller or mystery stories written by such people as Edgar Wallace and Sax Roma about sinister Chinese villains. You remember Dr. Fu Manchu? And there were all sorts of others like that. Strange, exotic figures who kept knives in their sleeves, who had ivory boxes full of the strangest poisons, but at the same time who had a kind of urbanity. And whereas other children at that time of life wanted, when they grew up, to become engineers driving trains or sports car champions or whatever it was, I wanted to become a Chinese villain. And so, just as every child at that time of life decorates their room with the things they're interested in, I became fascinated with the forms and the feeling of Chinese and Japanese art. And I still can't quite explain what it is, but it caught me. When I was a small boy, I used to haunt that section of London around the British Museum. And one day I came across a shop which had a notice over the window which said, Philosophical Instruments. Even as a boy, I knew something about philosophy, but I couldn't imagine what philosophical instruments could be. So I went up to the window and there displayed were chronometers, slide rules, scales, and all kinds of what we would now call scientific instruments. Because science used to be called natural philosophy. Because, as Aristotle says, the beginning of philosophy is wonder. Philosophy is man's expression of curiosity about everything, his attempt to make sense of the world primarily through his intellect. That is to say, his faculty for thinking. I was at that time in school at Canterbury, right under the shadow of the cathedral, which is the centre of the Church of England. 
But that wasn't my religion. And so at the age of 15, I announced in the midst of this great cathedral that I was a Buddhist. And the British are very tolerant of eccentricity. They said, jolly what, the man's a Buddhist. <laughs> Of course, subsequently, in the light of Buddhism, in the light of Hinduism, I re-studied Christianity and found it wasn't at all the sort of thing that had been presented to me as a boy. I found that out later, and so for a while became a, an Anglican priest. But in those days, being an Anglican priest somehow was not my proper role. So I just had to decide to go it alone and do my own thing. Of course, the knowledge of Eastern methods and ideas in the West is not much older than a hundred years. I hesitate, therefore, to predict what course they will take. It's like um, you thought that something out there was a flat disk and you suddenly discovered it was a ball. And so we're only just watching the beginnings of these influences. I should perhaps say how the, uh, my interest in calligraphy started. There was a well-known Japanese painter called Saburo Hasegawa who had been in New York. He was, he'd been a great friend of Franz Klein and he was scheduled to talk at the Asian Academy. Yeah. And Alan Watts, who was then the dean, telephoned to me and said, a Japanese painter is arriving and he's going to stay for a week and would I look after him? And uh, the, the next day I met uh, Asagawa and I took him for a walk in, in Muir Woods. And we walked for two hours. He didn't say anything. I didn't say anything. <laughs> well, when we came back, I said, would you like to go and have some lunch in my house, or would you like to go to my studio? And Hasegawa said, I'd like to go to your studio, which was on board a ferry boat, you know, on board a ferry boat at that time. So when we got on board, he looked around, you know, and looked at the floor and everything, and he indicated that he would like to do some calligraphy. And he started clearing the junk away and prepared a beautiful little place. And then he made a few characters. He made the character for infinity. And we had a wonderful session. He, he wrote the Japanese uh, alphabet and he, it was a memorable occasion. And we had tea. And he had a little um, three-quarter size tea ceremony kit, you know, uh, which was called um, a mountain water tea ceremony kit, you know, one to take on picnics. Yeah. Mountain water, I believe, means landscape. There's a line behind me from a Chinese poem. And it says, literally, day, ditto, in other words, day, day, that is good day. Every day is a good day. And it comes as the last line 
of this poem. In spring, hundreds of flowers. In summer, refreshing breeze. In autumn, the moon. Free your mind from idle thoughts. And for you, every season is a good season, or every day is a good day. And idle thoughts mean illusory thoughts, thoughts of pursuing a future, thoughts of making one's happiness depend on something which isn't here at all. And so, when in civilized societies we spend so much of our time living for the future, we become very much like those celebrated donkeys, you know, that have uh, a carrot fastened on a stick that's tied to the neck, you know, behind here, and it comes over and there's the carrot dangling in front of them. And they pursue it, pursue it, pursue it, but can never reach it. And so in exactly the same way, it's that way with us. My goodness, don't you remember when you went first to school? And you went to kindergarten. And in kindergarten, the idea was to push along so that you could get into first grade and then push along so that you could get into second grade, third grade, and so on, going up and up. And then you went to high school, and this was a great transition in life. And now the pressure is being put on. You must get ahead. You must go up the grades and finally be good enough to get to college. And then when you get to college, you're still going step by step, step by step, up to the great moment in which you're ready to go out into the world. And then when you get out into this famous world, comes the struggle for success in profession or business. And again, there seems to be a ladder before you, something for which you're reaching all the time. And then, suddenly, when you're about 40 or 45 years old, in the middle of life, you wake up one day and say, Huh? I've arrived. And by Jove, I feel pretty much the same as I've always felt. In fact, I'm not so sure that I don't feel a little bit cheated. Because, you see, you were fooled. You were always living for somewhere where you aren't. And while, as I said, it is of tremendous use for us to be able to look ahead in this way and to plan, there is no use planning for a future, which when you get to it and it becomes a present, you won't be there. You'll be living in some other future which hasn't yet arrived. And so in this way, one is never able actually to inherit and enjoy the fruits of one's action. You can't live at all unless you can live fully now. This is Japan, a country in which man and nature have learned to grow together in harmony, where houses don't stand out like sore thumbs, where the land is loved and carefully farmed, where a cooperation between man and nature has been achieved which is very largely the result of a form of Buddhism known in Japan as Zen. A form of Buddhism which is really a blend between the Buddhism of India and the Taoist philosophy of China. The latter particularly emphasizing the fact that man is a part of nature and instead of trying to conquer nature, must cooperate. It is absolutely fundamental in Buddhism to allow oneself to flow with the stream of life. Really, there's no way of preventing it. And trying to prevent it is like trying to swim against an overwhelmingly powerful current. 
that way one drowns. But by flowing with it, one ceases to waste energy resisting it, and all that energy is available as new energy for creative work in art and life. The Zen poem says, the waters before and the waters after, now and forever flowing, follow each other. It's basic to Chinese philosophy that death is part of life, just as space goes with solids. To resist death, to resist change, to resist transience is to resist life itself and to come to the feeling as a result of this resistance that you, as a human being, are in some way separate from life, that you don't belong in the universe, that you don't express its fundamental energy as waves express the existence of the water. Through Zen Buddhism, man has learned to cooperate with nature. There enters into it discipline and hard work, but this hard work is, as it were, flowing with the stream, cutting the wood with the grain, developing nature in the directions along which nature is already going. 